each son must choose. And and we've talked about over the last few studies, we've we've talked about uh, um, the pictures because that's what the Old Testament is. Old Testament is 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 stories, but they're also shadows and pictures of the truth. And and when you look at the pictures of Ishmael and and Isaac, and you look at the pictures of of Esau and Jacob, and you look at the pictures of the children that were that were in bondage in Egypt, and then uh, they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. They went baptized in the Red Sea. They went into the wilderness. They were going toward their inheritance. So so what we're going to do today? We're going to talk about um, we're going to talk mostly about Esau, uh, but we're going to talk about that each believer, because in a great house, right, there are vessels of honor and dishonor, that each believer has a choice. And we know, we understand that God knows all, all things. God knows from the foundation of the world whether you're going to get into the kingdom. Uh, God knew from the foundation of the world that he was going to destroy the world with a flood in the days of Noah, right? right. But, but you still, as a son, you have to choose. You have, you have to make a choice of, of what you believe and what you're going to do, and then you have to either do it or don't do it. And, and even though God knows what you're going to do, you cannot, you, cannot make, you cannot take the knowledge that God has of already knowing he God knows God knows what the end of the world is going to be like we know that because he, we have the book of revelation he tells us exactly what's going to happen in the end of the world because he spoke it and it's going to come to pass this it has no other choice the book of revelation is not going to change you know uh it's always going to be the same because that's exactly how it's going to happen and, and but but just because it's going to happen and just because God knows it's going to happen doesn't mean that it's happened yet. Right. Now, I don't know if that I don't know if that makes sense to a lot of people. But God, just because God knows whether, you, you know, you're going to be a vessel of honor or dishonor or just because God knows that you, whether you're going to get the inheritance or not. Does it mean that you can just sit around and wait for God right. to make you get up and build an ark or right. to make you get up and live holy. You still have to choose. And so that's kind of what we want to want to talk about today. So let's look at the context. And we've talked about this. Uh, these are the generations of the sons of Noah. So so we know Adam, the line that's going to lead to Christ goes all the way down from Adam, all the way to Noah. And then Noah is going to have three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then that line is not going to go through Ham or Japheth. It's going to go through Shem, and it's going to come all the way down. And finally, it's going to come to Abram or Abraham. And Abraham is going to have two sons. And even though Ishmael it was the oldest, the promise was through Isaac. So Isaac has... Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau, and and we know that Rebecca, they these were twins in her womb. And even though Jacob, the line goes through Jacob, we know Esau was the one that was born first. And it says, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, there were twins in her womb, and the first, the first of the twins came out red all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau. So Esau was the firstborn. Right. And we've already talked about this, the firstborn, right? He says, uh, if a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have both borne him children, both but the beloved and the hated, the firstborn, if the firstborn be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he make of his son's to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the first beloved firstborn before the son of the hated. Now, we know that this is talking about two wives, but this is one wife. This is Rebecca, and the two 
are not from two different women. They're the two are from the same woman. They're they're twins. But he's telling that the father, he's telling the father in Deuteronomy, whoever the father is, that if he loves one more than the other and the, the one he loves the most wasn't the firstborn, he doesn't have the right just because he loves one more than the other to make the one the, the firstborn. Because that's he's the one that gets to what? To inherit. And. So he cannot make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the, of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he had. He is the beginning of a strength, the right or the birthright, because he is the firstborn or he was born first is his. But this is a special situation. The firstborn was Esau, right? Right. And the father loved the firstborn. Right. In this situation, he's saying if if the father doesn't, he lo- he doesn't really love the firstborn. He loves the one that's born second. He doesn't have a right to do that. But in this situation, we're going to see this the the son. These are twins. The son that came out first. He's going to love him the most. And that's what Isaac does. Now, while he's in the firstborn, we're going to see this. Why? I'm sorry. Why he? While he's in the womb, it says the children struggled together within her, and she said, "If it be so, why am I thus?" And Rebecca went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord's going to answer Rebecca. Right. And the Lord said unto her, before these two children were ever born. Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder, the one that, now think about the first born. The elder. <laughs> when you read yeah. that, people, <laughs> people think like, oh, you know, the, yeah, he's older than the youngest one, right? Well, no, he's only causing the elder shall serve the younger because they, they're twins. Exactly. He came out of the one. The only reason he's the the got the birthright is because he was born first. And the only reason he's the elder and Jacob is the younger is just a matter of minutes. Right. Or seconds. Or seconds. However long it took. Yeah, because he grabbed this as he grabbed hold of Esau's heel. heel right. Right. Mm hmm. So the elder shall serve the younger. So, so remember, Rebecca is. She is. She has this knowledge from before the children are even born. And is it possible that God can lie? No. Not not possible. So she already knows something. That she knows that the God who cannot lie has told her that the one that doesn't, the one that comes out second. The one who comes out first is going to serve the one that comes out second. She already knew this. She had probably information that her husband did not have. Because here it says Isaac, guess what? Loved Esau. And Rebecca loved Jacob. And it doesn't tell you this, but it could be because of the type of person that Jacob was. But it, and it, but it could also be that she she had this knowledge that Isaac didn't have. And now this is going to be important because Isaac, in this this verse in Deuteronomy, it says what? He says, uh, it shall be when he make of his sons to inherit that which he had, that he, he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated. But he didn't hate Esau, did he? He didn't love Jacob more than Esau. He actually, the father, Love this son, Isaac, love this son, the firstborn son, more than he loved Jacob. And it it probably had a lot to do that he was firstborn. It probably had a lot to do that he was a hunter, right? Right. And so we're going to come to the situation where it was going to, Esau is going to make a life-changing decision. It says Jacob sod pottage, right? He was cooking, cooking him some stew, and 
Esau came from the field and he'd probably been out there hunting. It'd probably been hot and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Now, the, the word Edom just means he's red. And Jacob said, now look what he says. You want some of my stew? I'll make a deal with you. Sell me your birthright. Sell me this day your birthright. And Esau said, behold, I'm at the point to die. Now, I think there's a, he probably felt like he was pretty faint. He probably felt like he might pass out, but he, he probably wasn't going to die. Yeah. And he says, I'm at the point, and now look, look, at, look at the term. He says, what profit shall this birthright the right because i was born first jacob what what profit does it have so he's going to make he's going to sell him his birthright right he's going to sell it to him for a meal right and this is not a fair exchange no it's not a fair exchange at all because He's saying what profit? Well, he's going to find out later at the end of his father's life what profit it was, what he actually sold. And so he takes a situation where um, he doesn't put at very high value his birthright right. or being born first. So when 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 this little temptation comes along, when this temporary need he has arises, he does not consider his birthright so important or so valuable that he's going, to, he, that's why he says what profit, that he's literally going to sell something that is a spiritual inheritance for one meal. Right. And therefore the Bible says, he sold his birthright to Jacob, and thus Esau, guess what? He despised his birthright. He sold it for one meal. Now, that word despise means to have the lowest opinion of his birthright. He did not consider it important. Now, Jacob considered it very important to the point where he's like, he caught Esau in a time of weakness, right? Right. He caught Esau in a time where he he wanted some earthly thing so bad, some earthly pleasure so bad that he was willing to give everything away that belonged to him for one for for one meal, and and therefore the Bible is going to say something about him. He says, "Lest there be any fornicator or look at that word profane person as Esau." who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Profane is irreverent to anything sacred. God considers your spiritual inheritance sacred. He's a profane person. He says profane means proceeding from a contempt of sacred things to violate anything sacred or to treat it with abuse, irreverence, or contempt to apply to temporal, in other words, Temporal is temporary, or or to to consider it a common thing. He considered his eternal inheritance, not just his earthly inheritance, because Jacob now has that birthright. Right? Is that something that's going to be temporary? No. It said many are going to come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac. Does it say Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? No. No, in the kingdom. Right. It should have said Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Because the birthright was his. But because he was profane, because he despised it, he had the lowest opinion of it. He considered it something common or temporary, just like that meal. He he exchanged he exchanged his birthright 
he considered it common. I'm just exchanging something that's temporary and common for something else that's temporary and common. But that wasn't what he did. He actually gave something that was sacred, something that was eternal, away for something that would only last for a moment. Right. That's why you, when you see that the devil came to Jesus, right, and tempting him, <laughs> he said, you know, if you'll bow down, right, I'll give you, uh, uh, he offered him all the kingdoms of the world. Right. For a moment in time. And that's what the devil will do. The devil will come along and he will offer you something that is temporary. He will offer you something that is for just a moment in this world. And you have to, the only way that you can take that is you have to trade it for something. And that's what he did. Notice, notice what he said here. He says, this eternal inheritance that he was going to get, not just the earthly inheritance, because remember, he was going to in, he was going to inherit this. When his father died, he was going to be the ruler over the household. And he was going to get a double portion. He because he was that's what the ruler gets. He's, if if you're going to, if you're going to be responsible over all the family, then you should have more than the rest of the family. And that's what came with the double portion. And he just didn't consider it important. And so he says, "What what profit shall this birthright to me?" And that and look what Jesus says, "What." What is a man what? Profited if he shall gain the whole what? World. Now, now he did it. He sold it for just one meal. Right. But God's saying that that's, that's really despising because what you could get the whole world. And God would say, even if you got all the gold and silver in the world, even if you had mansions, right? Even if you had abundance your whole life, it still would not be worth trading it for your birthright. Yes. And what is a man profit if he gains the whole world? It's about what? Gain. And he's saying you could gain the whole, not just a meal, but you could gain the whole world and you lose your own soul. He says, what shall a man give in exchange for his eternal inheritance? Well, I know what Esau gave up for it, but it doesn't. And that's why that's why the devil, when he comes to Jesus, he offered him the kingdoms of the what? The world in exchange for the birthright, because he is the firstborn of all creatures. He's the firstborn from the dead. Jesus, and we will talk about this soon. Jesus is is the ultimate firstborn son. He was not going to exchange his birthright for any earthly good. Yes. Now, look at Paul. Paul says what things were what? Yes. Gain to me, right? <laughs> because Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Everybody looked at him in high esteem. He says, what things were gained to me, those things I counted loss for Christ. He says, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excell excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So here's a man who's willing to gain the whole world, right? Yes. And or Or give his birthright or his inheritance away for one meal. And Paul's saying, you know what? I gave everything up to get the inheritance. I, 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 Jacob only had to give up what? One meal. Paul's saying, you know what? This is how important it, this, this inheritance, this spiritual inheritance is. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things. I'm going to make I'm going to give something in exchange for my soul. I'm going to give something in exchange for my inheritance. And you know what Paul was willing to give up for it? All things. Right. He says, everything in my life, 
I count as loss. All those things that pe most people in the world look at you and say, wow, man, look at all those things that you've gained in your life. Look at that. You worked hard all your life for this and this and this and this. And Paul's saying, I count all that stuff as dung. And that's what we have to understand that God's going to tell you something. He's going to say, love not the world. Not just the world, the things that are in the world. We have to look at this as a husband who's married to a wife. He had, they have children together, right? They have a house. He's got a good job. They have they, they as a married couple, they have very intimate relationship with friends of theirs, right? They've worked hard for this. And then the man goes off to work. And he begins to flirt. With other women. And then eventually this leads to an inappropriate relationship, right? What he is doing, he's committing adultery and he's cheating on his wife, but he's doing something more. His affection is being taken away, is being taken away from his family. So when he's with his family, guess where his thoughts are? His thoughts are with the other woman. And so what happens is everything that he built in his whole life that was important, that was valuable. When he flirts with this, uh, these uh, maybe more than one woman, when he does this, when he flirts with her or he cheats with the other woman, he throws away everything because when it is, when it, it is, it is exposed, guess what? Everything in his life that he loved, everything that, that he built in his life, his marriage, his family, the relationships, everything is lost. Because he took his eyes off the thing that was important. And God is going to compare the world and the things that are in the world with the other woman. And he says that when you flirt with the world, when you cheat with the world, when you try to walk that line between your affections being in the world and your affections, uh, being with him, with God, that God considers it adultery. He considers it uh, you cheating on him. He says, love not the world, the thing, or neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the other woman, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. And the lust thereof, the other woman's going to go her separate way. And then what's left with your life because you lost your family. You lost your house. You lost the, your, your, the, the relationships, the friends that you had. Everything is destroyed because you took your eyes off, off the things that you built, the, your wife, your children. That's, and that, look what, look what the, the Lord says. He calls you, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know you not that the friendship of, what, of who? The other woman, the world, it's enmity. And enmity means deep hatred toward God. When you flirt with the world, when you cheat with the other, the world, with the other woman, God says that it's hatred to him. And Let's put yourself put yourself in the wife's perspective when she finds out that her husband what betrayed her, or it could be the other round that the the wife betrayed the husband. The trust is gone. The love you see it all the time. the The one who was cheated on went from loving that person to hating that person. Because of the betrayal. He says, whosoever, it doesn't matter, believer, whosoever of the believers, therefore, that will be a friend of the world, the other woman, is the enemy of who? Of God. You go from being, 
you go from your wife loving you to your wife what? Hating you. And that's what believers do not understand. You cannot flirt with the world and have your affection in one place and think that it can be in the other place. When you're with the other woman, guess what? You're not thinking about your wife and your family and everything that you're going to lose. Think about that. Everything that you're going to lose when you're with her because you're not, your affection's not at your home. Guess what? Where was Esau's affection? When he was hungry, was he thinking about his birthright and everything that he was going to lose? No. Understand. He says, thou shalt worship no other God. God, and guess, guess, guess who is the God of this world? And so when your heart and your affection are in the world, you're worshiping another God. He says, thou shalt not worship no other God for the, the Lord whose name is what? Is jealous, is a jealous God. When you get married to someone, your spouse doesn't want you going to work or going to a bar somewhere or hanging out with your friends and flirting with other women. They're going to be jealous. He says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them to serve them for i the lord thy god am a jealous god god does not and will not be right god will not be second if you want to flirt with the other woman the world if you want to commit adultery with the other woman, the world, you are, as a believer, you are the enemy of who? You're the enemy of God. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sit upon the right hand of God. Right. So what he says, set your affection not just seek those things, but set your affection on the things above. See, when you first met the woman that you you marry, you gave you were affectionate toward her. You showed you her your affection, right? But then you, when you took your eyes off of her and you started looking and flirting with the other woman, then all of a sudden you you took your affection and you put it on the things of the world. He says. Don't set your affection on things above, not on things on what? The earth, the world, the other woman. And so that is what God is trying to tell believers. That you cannot have your affection here on earth and be pleasing and be pleasing to your father. You cannot do it. You cannot flirt with somebody else and expect the person to sit at home, wait for you, and come home. And when you do get home, think about this. When the man is either committing adultery or his affection is on the woman that he's at work with or wherever he knows her, and then he comes home, where is his mind? It's on the other woman. It's on the world. And therefore, God tells every believer, I entitled this, each son must what? You must choose. You have a choice. And guess what? Esau had a choice. He's, he says, what profit shall this birthright do to me? He couldn't see that giving this away was going to destroy everything that belonged to him everything that was rightfully his by birth, he was going to give it away in one moment of temptation, in one moment of trying to satisfy some earthly, you know, um, 
pleasure, temporary pleasure, that he was selling everything that was rightfully his. And when you stand at the judgment seat, if you have if you have flirted with the world, if you have committed adultery with the world, guess what you've done? You sold your birthright. That's why God calls you, if you're doing this, if you're walking that thin line to think, oh, I, I'm going to serve the Lord, but I'm going to have one foot in the world. He calls you an adulterer. He calls you his what? Enemy. You can't expect your wife to give you, you, what if a man thinks that he can expect his, once his wife finds out that he's cheating, that his wife should, is still going to give him all the affection and love that she used to, he's deceiving himself. Right. There's no way that she's going to love you and give you all of her affection when she knows that you're cheating on her. And God is a jealous God, right? Yes. Now look at this word, because God wants you to choose. Do you, do you want the other woman? Do you want the world? Or do you want me? He says, this is the definition to choose, to pick out, to select, to take by way of preference. Look at that, preference. He wants you to prefer him or have preference from two or more things offered. To have the power of choice. He gives you a choice. Two or more things. The world or him. Right. And just like the man. He's got a choice. You, he can't have both. He can't have the other woman and his wife. Right. You have to. And Joshua. Look what Joshua says. He says now therefore. He's talking to the Israelites, fear the Lord and do what? Serve him, right? Set your affection on him. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Sincerity. You can't be sincerely serve him if your heart is in two places. And put away the gods. Put away the other woman. Put away the world. Serve him and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And, and, and look what God's going to say, or, or Joshua's going to say, he says, if it seem evil unto you, right? If it seems evil to you to, to love your wife, right? And not to put away the other woman, then choose. Look at that word. Choose. Choose. Say, listen, it's not fair to your wife for you to do what? Have the other woman and then come home to her and pretend like she's everything to you. It's not fair to her. So if it seems evil to just have one wife, just to love her and to love your children and love the life that you built, if, it, if it's evil for you to do that, then just choose. Choose the other woman. Throw everything away. Guess what, Esau? Choose. If it seems evil, that birthright's evil to you, it's not important to you, then choose the meal. Take the meal, give it away. But choose. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to prefer or take preference between him and the world. Choose who you this day, who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods and the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, this is what Joshua was saying, we will serve the Lord. We choose, I'm choosing. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord. Because when you choose to serve the other gods, when you choose to, to be with the other woman, when you choose the world, right? Do you know what you're doing? You're forsaking the Lord. When you choose the other woman, you're forsaking your wife. 
you cannot you cannot choose both of them when you choose the world you're choosing guess who the god of this world and he says to if you're going to choose him you need to put away what the other gods when you love the world and the things that are in the world you're making a choice and you're saying okay god i'm going to ignore you and i'm going to ignore my inheritance uh my eternal inheritance i choose a worldly earthly good a pleasure over you christ had that choice didn't he yes. the, the dev, this is what the devil the, this is what the god of this world said to to jesus he says, all the kingdoms of the world, they've been given to me. I can do what I want with them. And I'm going to offer them to you, Jesus, if you'll bow down and worship me. <laughs> and he said, it's written, thou shalt serve, what, right? right? The Lord thy God and him only. Jesus made a choice. The kingdoms of this world. And what does he say? You can what? You can what? Um, what does it profit if you gain the whole world, all the kingdoms of the world? What are you willing to give in exchange for your soul? What are you willing to exchange for your eternal inheritance? Are you going to be a profane person like Esau? He did not consider it important. What profit does it have for me? He was profane. And when you make that choice, to be in the world and to serve the world and to live for the things in the world, God says, you are an adulterer. You're an adult. If you're a woman, you're an adulteress. You have forsaken the Lord. You cannot serve both. You got to choose. That's what he says here. No man can serve what? Two masters. Two masters. You're going to, when you love the world and the things in the world, you're serving the God of this world. And guess what? That's the other woman. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to either hate the one and love the other, or else you're going to hold to the one and what? Despise it. Because when you're with the other woman, when you're in the when you're in the world and loving the world, are you even thinking about the Lord? Are you thinking about your wife sitting at home? No. You can't have both. Your mind is just not the way that our minds work. Our affection has to be in one, can only be in one place at one time. And when there's something else, when the other woman, when the world is in your life, even when you're with your wife, even when you're sitting in that, that church pew, right? Where's, where's your heart? It's in the world. You may get up on Sunday morning. And eventually, you know what happens? You're going you're gonna to like, oh, and you know what? Forget that Bible study. Because where's your heart? The world. It's, with, it's in the world. It's with the other woman. That's all you think about. Even when you're with the one you say you love, it's not really the one you love, is it? You can tell my, your wife, oh, I love you, I love you, because you, you found, she found out. Now she's leaving you. She's taking the children. She's taking the house. She's taking everything. And then all of a sudden, reality hits. I gave it all up because I wanted to flirt with the world, with the other woman. I gave it all up. Esau, his reality didn't hit. It didn't. It wasn't important to him until it was time. Well, until it was time to be important to him, right? God says you have to choose. He says I have set before thee two things, right? Right. Your wife, the other woman, God or the or the world. I have set before thee this day, life and good and what? There's two things: and evil. death and evil. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his way, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgment, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land, whether thou goest to possess it. Choose that. But 
if thine heart, and that's the problem, if your heart turn away from your wife, right? So that thou will not hear, but shall be what? Drawn away by the other woman and worship other gods and serve them. That's, that's the world. That's the other woman. I denounce unto you this day that you shall, you shall surely what? He's saying that you made a choice. Right. And that you shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. <clears throat> I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. <clears throat> that I have set before you life and death, two things, blessing and cursing. And God urges you, therefore, to do what? Choose life. But it's, a, but it's still your choice that both you and thy seed may live. Choose this one, believer, not this one. Choose your wife over the other woman. Choose God the creator of all things over the God of this world. Look, set your affection in heaven, right? right? Because where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And don't, and therefore your heart, that's what God wants you. If you seek treasure in heaven and you do things here and you have treasures in heaven, he says, where your treasures, there will your heart be. Your heart won't turn away. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on your inheritance. That's where your inheritance is. It's in heaven right now waiting for you. Amen. You choose. Every, every believer has a choice. Esau had a choice. And he was a profane person. He did not consider it important. He considered it like a, just a common thing. Just like that meal. He thought it was a, he exchanged it for something that, I, I'm getting something right now. I, this inheritance, I'm not getting any of it. I don't have my inheritance now. The inherit you don't get your inheritance till your father dies. You know that? You have to wait. But is it worth waiting for? Well, you yes. you choose that. You decide that. You get a choice. God's not going to make you choose. What? Remember what Joshua said? If it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose. If you, if you don't want your wife, you don't want your children, you don't want your house, you don't, you don't care about all none of that stuff, choose the other woman, but choose. Set your eyes on the Lord. In Isaiah, he says, for thus saith the Lord to the eunuchs, they keep my Sabbath. Because see, this, this here was talking to, this here was particularly talking to Israel. But watch this. He says, thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath. And look what the word says. And choose the things that please me. And take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of the sons and uh, of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also, the sons of who? The stranger. The stranger to Israel that join themselves to the Lord to do what? To serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, in the house of prayer. <clears throat> their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for how many people? Even the stranger, the Lord God, which gathered the outcast of Israel, said, yet will I gather others to him. All they have to do is choose. Choose life and choose good and not death and evil. Not just to Israel, but to the stranger, to all people. Choose. And that's all God wants. He's going to set two things in front of you. The devil did what? He set two things in front of Jesus. And J Jesus chose. He set two things in front of Esau, and Esau 
chose. He set two things in front of the Apostle Paul. And he chose. He's going to set two things in front of Moses. And guess what? He says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look at the word. Choosing. He made a choice. He's choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to, than, here's the other choice, to enjoy what? The pleasures of sin for a season. Let me ask you, if, he, if Esau had been in the position of Moses, which one would he have chose? He would have chose to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because he had a choice. Think about where Moses lived. He lived in the house of the most powerful and most rich man in the world. And he made a choice. And why did he make this choice? He says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Now look at that word respect. It means to esteem as possessed of what? Real worth. He considered, he didn't consider the pleasures of sin, just like Jesus didn't consider the kingdom of this world of real worth. He considered the inheritance, something that he couldn't touch yet, something that he didn't have yet. Jacob considered it important because he, tried, he bought it from him, didn't he? Right. He gave him a meal. He, he took it from him. And that's different because Moses and Jacob had respect. They considered the inheritance, even though they couldn't see it yet, of real worth. Whereas Esau despised it. He considered what? He had the lowest opinion. What profit does it have? Just because you can't touch it and see it yet, doesn't mean that it, it's not way more valuable right. because East, I mean, because Saul or Paul said, well, I count all things in this world as dung. Right. Everything that I thought was valuable and of worth in this world wasn't, is, isn't. Yeah. So do you have respect for your eternal inheritance? Do you consider it of real worth? Or do you have a low opinion of it? That you would be willing to flirt with the world, the other woman, that you'd be able to commit adultery with the other woman, and think that when you stand before your father, that he's like, oh, that's all right. It's all right that, you know, you know I'm not, je God's jealous. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Yes. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. But who you serve in Martha? And, 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 and Martha, because listen, Martha received him into her house and Martha was doing much serving. And so Martha comes to him and says, Lord, don't you care? I don't know how you could talk to the Lord that way, but don't you care that my sister Mary has left me to serve alone? Bid her. Now you think about this. Martha is telling the Lord, Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said unto Martha, 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 you are careful and troubled about many things. You got many women on your mind. The husband's got many women on his mind, right? Many, well, not just women. He he cares about his job. He cares about Oh, I want to go. I want to. I want to go drinking with the boys. I want to go play golf with the boys. I want to do this. I want to do that. You got many things on your mind, right? Right. And your wife's sitting at home. 
You care about all these things, Martha, but only one thing's needful. You better take care of the thing that's important. As for the man who he needs to go home and take care of his family, that's needful. You, believer, need to take your eyes off the world, the things of the world, because one thing is needful. God is a jealous God. And you know what Mary did? She had what? She made. She could have got up and served, but she made a choice. And guess what she chose? The good part. And I will not, that will not be what? Taken away from her. God will never rebuke you for choosing the good part. He will never, he will never, if you choose him, he will bless you. And that's, that's, if you go back up here and you look at what um, Joshua said, right? right? He says, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve him in sincerity and truth. I'm going to put away the world. I'm going to put away the other gods, right? He says, choose this day who you will serve. Don't forsake the Lord. God will bless you. And guess what he did with Joshua? He blessed Joshua. But you have to choose. You cannot choose both. And, and Mary, Mary chose right here. That's what she chose. To sit at the feet of the Lord and to hear his word. When you wake up every morning and that Bible is sitting there and God wants you to go to him and talk to him in prayer and God wants you to read his word, right? And you walk past the word and you walk past the Lord because you know what you got on your mind? Many things. Well, I got to do this today and I got to do that. Where, where's your heart? It's with the other woman. It's with the world. And only one thing is needful. And you, as a believer, have to choose the good part every day when you wake up. Will I pray to God? Will I talk to him? Will I spend time in his word? Or will I choose the other woman? Will I choose the world? He says, wisdom crieth without. She, wisdom, utter of her voice in the streets. Wisdom crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gate, in the city. Wisdom utter of her words, saying, how long, you simple, uh, simple ones, will you love simplicities? And the, the, the scorners delight in their scorning. But fools hate. They're going to hate knowledge. They're going to hate wisdom. Why? Because their heart can't be in both places at the same time. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and you what? Refuse. I picture the wife. Where's my husband at? It's late. He's not home. He should be home. I'm calling him. And guess what? He's not answering. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. So guess what I'm going to do? When all of a sudden you come home at the, you know, from being out all night and you've been with the other woman and now, now you want to tell me you love me. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, right? But I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I was out all night. I'm so sorry, right? But see, that's how knowledge and wisdom works. They hate, they hated knowledge. And that you look at you look at modern Christianity today. And they tell you, oh, you know, you don't got nothing to worry about. Nothing's gonna happen to you at the judgment seat. 
God's not going to judge you. Oh, you might lose a few rewards, right? But that's it. You know why they believe that? They Because they hate knowledge. And they made a choice. And they did not choose this right here. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. They chose to ignore wisdom. They chose to ignore knowledge because it's in the scripture. God says, what, what more could I have been done more that I have not done? He's talking about Israel here. But when you stand before him, he's going to say, I did everything that I could do to get you to choose me. But guess what you chose? You chose, you chose the world. That wife did everything she could, could to get her husband to love her. And what did she? Cho what did he choose? He chose not to. He chose to put his affection somewhere else. And now everything that he worked for is gone. And it will, it's going to be the same with you at the judgment seat, believer. And it's it's going to be the same with Esau. He chose. He made a choice, and. When the end of his father's life come and he should get his inheritance, he's going to find out something. And you know what? God sets before you two things. And you know what you do? Fools despise what? They despise wisdom. Now think about that word despise. Esau did what? He despised his birthright. He put it at the lowest. It was not important. To him. Knowledge. Fools despise wisdom. And guess what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They despise the wisdom. They despise the fear of the Lord. And when you despise something. You don't think that it's important. Just like Esau didn't think that his birthright that being born first, that that inheritance was important, then it's going to come back to haunt you. You're making a choice. If you choose not, if you choose not the fear of the Lord, right? Yes. Because the fear of the Lord is wisdom, then you're going to end up standing before the Lord one day and realizing that it is too late to save your marriage. It is too late for you to choose God over the world because you already made your choice. It's too late. As Esau, he made his choice. He says, envy thou not the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. God wants you to do this. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may look at the word. No. You see that word? Here it is right here. No. And that's the problem. You know what? You need, you need to choose the fear of the Lord. And most people, most people don't choose good. Most believers, guess what they do? They despise, they despise their birthright. They despise good. They, cho they don't choose good. Knowledge is when you refuse the evil and choose the good. But God is always going to give you a choice. Remember what Joshua said. If it seemed evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose. Right. To make, remember what choose means? It's to prefer between two or more things, to make a choice. He says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without what? Preferring one before another, doing nothing in partiality. You need to choose part. Look at partiality and inclination to favor one party or one side of a question more than the other. That's why he says you can't serve two masters. Your heart can't be in two places at the same time. 
God wants you to choose him, to have preference toward him over two or more things. What is those two or more things? The world and the things of the world. You have to choose. He says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give up to all men liberally and it braideth not and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering to fluctuate, right? To waver, to be unsettled in opinion. That's the problem with believers. They waver. They're they're unstable. <clears throat> God wants you to choose. He wants you to quit wavering. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God, nothing wavering for he that wavereth, he that fluctuates, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. He can't decide whether he wants to serve the world, become rich, have everything in this life. He can't decide whether, you know what, should I, should I, is this, is this internal inheritance important to me? Because I'm hungry right now. And, you know, Jacob, that meal looks really good. So, you know, that, 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 that inheritance is not profitable to me, profitable to me. But when he's saying that, what he's really saying, it's not profitable, profitable to me right now. It's not going to give do anything. My inheritance is not going to do anything for me right now. Therefore, I'm going to choose the meal. My, my inheritance as a believer is not important to me because I can't have it right now. But guess what I can have? I can work two jobs. I can have lots of money. I can live in a mansion. I can have three cars. I can have this. I can have that. Jesus made a choice. It's like, no. What profit, right? To gain the whole world. You think that you're not making a choice, believer, when you choose the world and the things of the world, but you are making a choice. You're just like Esau. You're selling your birthright. He says, let not that man think that he shall what? If you, if you choose the world, the other woman, don't think that you're going to receive anything of the Lord. When it comes to time to receive your inheritance, because a double-minded man a man that can't choose whether he wants to serve God or serve the world. And God says, you got to choose. If you can't choose, you are unstable. You are, you fluctuate all the time. You waver all the time. Oh, I want to serve God. No, I want to serve the world. No, I, I want, I want gold and silver. No, 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 no. I, I want, I want to serve God. If you can't make up your mind between the other woman and your wife, God says, pick, pick. He says, the wisdom, the wisdom that is from above is pure. It's peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fr fruits without partiality. It doesn't waver. And that's the problem with the modern church. The modern church, God sets two things before you and you can't choose. And he says, I know your works. You're neither what? Cold or hot. I would that you were cold or hot. Choose. So then because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. When that time comes for you to receive your inheritance, because you couldn't, listen, if you choose the other woman, you're in trouble. But if you don't choose the wife, you can't make up your mind, well, do I want the other woman or do I want my wife? And you keep going back and forth, you're still in trouble. You have to choose. And here, here it is, it says Isaac, his father, here comes Esau, he's bringing in the food, the venison, right? He says, who are you? Who, who are thou? He said, I am thy son, thy what? Look what he said. Well, look what he calls himself. The first, he calls himself the firstborn. He forgot something. He sold that birthright. Did God forget it? No. 
And Isaac trembled because Isaac loved Esau. His father loves him. His father wanted to give him the birthright. And Isaac trembled exceedingly, very exceedingly, and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all that uh, all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Yea, now look what he says. The father that loved Esau and that blessed Jacob says, Yea, and he shall be blessed. I cannot take back those words. And when Esau heard the words of his father, guess what he did? He cried with a bit, exceeding bitter cry. And look, look, he says, and he said unto who? His father. This is not about, this has got nothing to do with whether you're a son or not. Esau was Isaac's son, the son that he loved. And he cries unto his father, bless me, even me also, O oh my father. And he said, thy, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my, no, he didn't take away your birthright. Mm -hmm. You gave it to him for a earthly, you know, an earthly temporary pleasure, a meal. Right. You gave it away. You made the choice, Esau. You didn't have to. Right. But you thought, oh, what profit is it? Well, now think about what you, this, that should have been yours. This meeting right now should have been what? This joyful meeting, no crying, no mourning. He says, behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. He ain't taken away nothing from you. You gave it to him. You sold it to him. He says, Has thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto him, Behold. <laughs> look, he asked for a blessing. And look what he says to him. I have made Jacob your Lord. That should have been yours, Esau. But you're profane. You don't care about your spiritual, eternal inheritance. And all his brethren have I given to Jacob. For servants and with corn and wine, I have sustained Jacob. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? Doesn't ever deny that Esau is his son because it has nothing to do with whether you're a son or not, it has to do with your inheritance. And Esau said unto his father, Has thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. He's pleading and crying to his father. That is a message to you, believer, that on that day when you stand at the judgment seat, you're making a choice right now in your life. You're going to stand before your father and you're going to cry to him and you're going to plead with him about your inheritance. And he's going to say, you made a choice when you serve this world. You made a choice when you loved the world and the things that were in the world. And Esau lifted up his voice, and guess what? He wept. He cried. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above, and thy sword shalt thou live and shalt, guess what? You're going to serve your father. And you know what? It's going to be the same in the kingdom. When one when one believer gets into the inheritance of the kingdom and the other doesn't, the time is going to come and God's going to wipe away the tears after the kingdom. He's going to wipe away your tears, believer, when you lose your inheritance. And when you go into eternity, you know who you're going to be serving? You're going to be serving the, the firstborn, the one who grabbed hold of his birthright, the one who who was not profane, the one who said, you know what? I'm going to serve the Lord. I choose to serve the Lord. This world, I don't care about. Because in a great house, there are vessels of honor and there's vessels of dishonor. 
And it says, lest there be any fornicated believer or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, right, when he would have inherited this right here, he should have been, this should have been when he would have inherited. Right. He should have got his inheritance. Guess what? He's rejected. He was rejected because he found no place of, it's too late to repent at the judgment seat of Christ, just like it was too late to repent here. God says the, t the day of repentance is now. That's why Jesus came telling his people, John the Baptist came telling God's people, repent, the kingdom is at hand. That's your, in it's got nothing to do with being a son. It's your eternal inheritance. And he's saying right now, if Esau had repented and had not waited to the end, he could have he could have retained his birthright. He could have retained his inheritance. But guess what? He waited until he, his father was dying, just like most believers are going to wait to the judgment seat of Christ. And they're not going to find any place of repentance, even though they seek it carefully with what? Tears. This is a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. If you live your life, listen to me, believer. If you live your life and the world is more important to you, money, women, pleasures. If that's more important to you than your eternal inheritance, God says you are a profane person. You do not have, you do not hold your inheritance. You hold it in low regard. Whereas Paul or, um, or Moses, he chose it, right? He had respect. He held it in high regard to the point where he left, he left a house, the house of Pharaoh, which was the most powerful and the richest man in the world. He could have lived in that house to the day he died. Right. He said, I have more respect for God being a greater rewarder. He respected it. So do you have respect? I don't think that believers hold in respect how valuable their inheritance in the kingdom is. Right. Because they're selling it. They're giving it away because their heart is in the world. Their heart is with the other woman. They're throwing everything away, just like that man who chooses the other woman is throwing everything away. You, as a believer, are going to throw everything away, just like Esau, throw everything away because you said, what profit does it have for me now? You can't see the judgment seat. You had best take your eyes, get in the word, and find out that this in eternal inheritance, there is nothing in this world. You can gain the whole world. You can be, the devil can ask, offer you all the kingdoms of the world, but it is not to be compared with what God has prepared for you. I have not seen, right? Right. And then, because one day, this is what's going to happen. He says, once the master of the house has risen up and have shut the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then shall you begin to say, we've eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be what? Weeping, Weeping. right? It's too late for repentance. You will be just like Esau. You're going to be rejected, even though you're going to seek it carefully, this repentance with tears. The judgment seat is not the time for repentance. Now is the time. Repent. The kingdom is at hand. Take your eyes off the other woman. <coughs> Repent, and God will take you back right now. Turn your heart toward him. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and not Esau, but who? Jacob and all the prophets. Where? In the kingdom. kingdom of God. And you yourselves 
thrust out because you lost your inheritance. You didn't consider it important. And they shall come from east and west and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom. And you're going to be cast out. Why? Because you sold your birthright, your inheritance. And people will say, well, no, that's for all Christians. No, the inheritance is for the faithful believer. It is for the believer who considers it important and valuable and is not a profane person who does not despise it. When you sit here and tell me, oh, all Christians get the kingdom, you got nothing to worry about. You know what you're doing? You're despising your birthright. You think it's not valuable. You hold it of low esteem. Whereas Moses gave up everything. Paul said, I count all the things that I've gained as dung. But you want to be like Esau. Oh, I'll sell it for I'll sell it for this new job, right? I'll sell it. I'll, I'll take this other woman for my wife, not realizing what you're giving up. The kingdom is the inheritance, and you yourself are going to be thrust out on that day because you could not see past today. You couldn't see past this present temporary world. Paul says, "You know." This you know, believer in Ephesus, that no whoremonger, nor uncommon person, nor covetous man who is an idolater have any, look at that, any inheritance in the what? In the kingdom. kingdom. Because you chose the world. You made a choice. And you said, well, no, I, I, I serve God. Listen, you, you cannot... You, if you choose the world full out, God says that would that would be better. But you're not hot or cold. You want to walk in the world and then still try to serve God, and you can't do both. You can't you can't love the other woman and then expect your wife to do what? Give you affection. It's the same with God, who is the most jealous of all. You can't think that you can walk in the world and then all of a sudden come back home and say, oh, oh, honey, I love you, and then go back out to the other woman. You can't do it. You don't will have no inheritance in the kingdom. He says to the Galatians, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I, I've told you, believer. I keep telling you over and over, as I've told you in time past, that if you do these things, you shall not get your inheritance. You're throwing away your firstborn right. You're, you're selling your birthright away for an earthly, temporary pleasure. Today, you need to choose. choose Paul, uh, Joshua said, choose this day. If it's evil, if you think it's evil to serve the Lord, then choose. But as for me and my house, we don't choose to serve the world. We don't choose to serve the God of this world. We don't choose the kingdoms of this world, right? Because we have respect we hold in high regard the recompense that God is going to give us on that day. Esau cried and cried and cried, but it was too late. I'll let you look at the words of I'll let you, I'll let you look at the words of Isaac one more time, and we'll close. He says, and Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, "Who? Where is he that hath taken venison?" And brought it me, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him. Even though the father loved his firstborn son, he sold his birthright, he despised it. And he blessed Jacob. And he says, yea, he's the one that's going to be blessed. And Esau cried with a bitter cry. He took away Esau's birthright because Esau didn't care. 
And that's the that that's that's the choice. By not making a choice, you're making a choice. That's that's the point. By not making a choice between the wife and the other woman, you're making a choice. By not making a choice between the world and God, you're making a choice. All right. That's all I have.